Buenas noches, senores. That's probably the extent of my Spanish tonight. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, present uh, me oficina in your Zoom conference here. Um, a little background here. I'm going to, if you see my face, it's because I'm looking over to speaker notes uh, next to me here. This uh, presentation uh, shows stamps honoring Francisco Morazon. Uh, my goal in uh, this presentation is to encourage more philatelic research on this American hero. Um, I uh, visited recently the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, which is in Denver, and was invited to make a Zoom presentation to them. Over Christmas, I visited Honduras, visited Tegucigalpa, Cholteca, Amapawa. I met up with Mauricio, learned about the uh, San Juan uh, stamps, and uh, there should be an article about that appearing uh, thanks to Henry and uh, Mauricio's help. Uh, possibly tomorrow morning in the weekly Lynn Stamp News. Um, so he, uh, Mauricio was the one that offered me the invitation to attend this presentation. So let's get rolling here. We have about 60 slides, I think, uh, something like that. This is an overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, since I expect most of you know a lot more about Central American history than I, I will probably zoom through that a little more quickly. I'll slow down a little bit on Morazan, especially because I have some stamps to kind of show highlights of his life. Um, the bulk of the presentation will be an overview of Morazan pictured on stamps. And then I will provide an update on uh, my favorite Morazon stamp, which is a 1941 Honduras postal tax stamp. And then I would really encourage a lot of questions and comments. Um, I will be giving this presentation to two groups in Florida later on next month. It's a work in progress. And as soon as I get enough uh, feedback, I'm gonna put this together in, in an exhibit of some sort in some place or shape. So that's my plan here for the presentation tonight. Um, my first attempt at sharing this information on Morazon was in December 1910. I put an exhibit in the Florex show in Orlando. The focus was on strictly the um, 1941 postal tax stamp from Honduras, RA number two. It was 32 pages, two frames, um, got a silver award. Most of the judges said it would be better if I boiled it down to one frame. And of course, since that time, I have increased the amount of material that I have. So it will no longer fit into one frame as best as I can tell. Uh, so in, 19, in 2016, uh, I made a presentation which is archived on the website that you see at the base of the, the screen there. And it has a lot more of the details on that postal tax stamp um, I won't go through that uh, all that information again. I've decided to add the new material and make this more of a thematic type of a presentation as opposed to a one stamp uh, traditional. Um, as an aside, in uh, two years ago, I put together a one page exhibit. Boy, that is a challenge. Um, but the, the exhibit was just on the Morazan statue, which is in Tegucigalpa. We'll talk more about, about those stamps later. Um, it forced me to belong to the American Topical Association. Uh, anyone is invited to assemble and submit one page exhibits. They are non competitive, they are virtual. Um, if they meet the guidelines, they will be put on the ATA website, which is at the base of your uh, presentation page there. So I uh, encourage you to take a look at the ATA um, and in the near future as well. Let's go a little bit into Central American uh, general history, uh, something that the North, North Americans do not realize is that Central America is not six countries, it is five countries the traditional uh, uh, original Spanish colonies there, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. Um, the, um, the basic history, of course, is that um, 
this was these were Spanish colonies, part of the viceroyalty of um, New Spain. Um, in 1821, they became part of the first Mexican Empire, um, including these uh, what's now the five Central American republics. Um, they didn't like that association. Uh, I won't go into the politics a whole lot, but two years later, they uh, successfully succeeded peacefully and became a single country, the Feder Federal Republic of Central America. Things did not work out well for one country to exist with all the politics going on. So in 1838, uh, they started to drop out by 1841, there were now five independent republics where there was originally one. Um, and again, a reminder that Central America does not include um, what is uh, now called Belize. It does not actually include Panama, which was part of the viceroyalty of, uh, uh, I forget the name, but it's, it's now uh, Colombia. So why Morazon? Why do we consider him to be such an important uh, uh, figure in American history? And I include him in North American history too. He did not have direct contact with North America, but I think his influence needs to be reviewed by the people in uh, the United States of America. He's beloved by Central Americans, much like Washington is beloved and admired in the United States. His grandfather was a Corsican immigrant his parents were um, upper middle class uh, cre uh, Creoles, I'm mispronouncing the Spanish uh, version there. Um, of course, these are offspring of the Spanish settlers that lived in Latin America. And because they were born here, they were blocked from positions of authority by the Spanish born colonial leaders. And that led to a lot of dissatisfaction. Shown on this slide is um, his place of baptism, what Scott C. 125 and the arms of the Central American Republic on Scott C-126. Uh, in, in retrospect, his liberal approach to politics differed from many of the more conservative views, and that led to his eventual execution. Uh, so in 1792, he was born in Tegucigalpa, October 3rd, 1792. Um, something that Mauricio helped me out with here is that uh, historians do not agree as to which particular building he may have been born in, uh, but both of these occur on uh, Honduras stamps, both C-122 and C-721. Um, so he was uh, born there in his uh, birthday is a national holiday in Honduras. I believe it's called Soldier's Day. He was largely self-educated, but he was tutored in law. In 1821, he was uh, after the Central American independence, he was appointed deputy mayor, lawyer to Tegucigalpa. There were inner city rivalries between the cities of Tegucigalpa and Comayagua, and this resulted in military actions. It caused Morazan to join the militia. He was appointed a captain in the uh, militia there. And then in 1824, he was appointed Secretary General of Honduras by Herrera, who was then the head of the Central American Republic. And Herrera appears on a series of stamps shown here is Scott 512. Uh, Herrera was actually his uncle and his tutor, his law tutor. Moving on to 1825, he married the widow Maria uh, Lastiri, who was a uh, daughter of a prominent trading family in the Cathedral of uh, Comayagua. Uh, she's seen here on Scott C. 254 and Scott C. 858. Um, he became, uh, in, well, the first president of the Central American Republic was Arce, who's shown here on Salvador 475. Um, Arce disputed Herrera's power, uh, eventually arrested both Herrera and Morazan in 1827. Uh, thankfully, Morazan escaped that first imprisonment there. He uh, escaped from uh, his imprisonment several times uh, through his lifetime. Morazan met with other liberals, formed an army, and um, the uh, Battle of La Trinidad 
sort of resulted after that. Um, this is a place where my presentation is a little different from the one that you may have, Mauricio. Um, when uh, I was recently in Honduras, um, we visited the battle site, the Battle of Trinidad, and surprisingly, uh, there's a lot of trash around, but among the trash on the ground was this five Lempira banknote. And it shows, of course, the, the picture of Morazan. And on the back side, it shows the Battle of Trinidad, which is probably why somebody left it there to blow in the wind. Um, shown here is a picture, and I don't know if anybody outside of Honduras would recognize the name Colonel Omar Zelaya. Uh, Colonel Zelaya um, is 90 some years old, and he is my wife's uncle. And this was the first time that he had ever visited the uh, uh, La Trinidad battle site and the monument there. I noticed when we were leaving next to that, down here at the bottom, is a picture of a cabin, which is on the same site. And if you look carefully on the banknote, you will see the cabin there, and you will see it in some of the other pictures of the Battle of Trinidad coming up here. Here's uh, probably the most famous stamp showing the Battle of Trinidad. It was part of that Morazan Centennial issue in 1942. Um, C-121 is the Scott number. And this shows a plaque that is on the statue in Tegucigalpa. Uh, you can also see the Battle of Trinidad. Uh, and I've cropped this picture here. This is the... Um, uh, 1992 souvenir sheet from Honduras that shows Marzan. We'll see the whole thing later on, but I wanted to show the battle scene there and what's there in the background there. The cabin is still there. So uh, another interesting thing that uh, Mauricio brought to my attention was after the battle was won by Marzan and his troops, uh, they collected a lot of the rifles from that battlefield and use the uh, barrels of the rifle to create a fence. And I wish I had a picture of it, Mauricio, to add uh, to this presentation. Someday I'll go back and visit that. So they actually use that as the upright pickets in the metal fence that is near the Honduras uh, Congress building there. So moving on to a little more of the history, 1830. Um, he was, uh, Morazan was elected president of the Central American Republic over uh, Del Valle. Uh, Del Valle is shown, we have a, a Chile in here. There's your Chile connection. Honduras, uh, Scott's number 996. And um, his, uh, Morazan's efforts to implement liberal poly policies threatened a lot of the conservative interests. So in 1834, Valle, was elected the president of the Central American Republic. Uh, so this was the second election for the Central American Republic, but he died before he took office. So Morazan re remained as president. Uh, he was re-inaugurated in 1835. And things worked along for, well, let's go back. Things worked along for a little bit there uh, until he was challenged by this gentleman here. Here's our Guatemalan connection, um, uh, Rafael Carrara. Uh, led a rebel army in 1837. Um, there's not a lot of stamps of Carrara that I've been able to uh, pick out. So that would might be a very small uh, topical collection as best as I can tell. So help me out on that if that is true. And anyway, the term uh, from 1834 to 1839, it ended uh, with that. There was no new election and essentially the Central American Republic um, collapsed at that point. Okay, so uh, there was still was one part of the Central American Republic, and that was what's now El Salvador, and Morazan remained the head of that. 1840, uh, the Liberal Army defeated uh, was defeated by Carrara, and uh, Morazan um, skedaddled, went to uh, David in Panama, and to Peru. So there's our Peru connection there uh, for, for some of our folks here from tonight. 1841, he returned to El Salvador. He was offered uh, the position to repel the British in La Mosquita, and he declined that uh, position in 1842. Uh, he ousted the Costa Rican leader, uh, Carrillo. Um, he attempted to raise troops and reunite the Central American Republic. 
they didn't want to participate in his uh, battle, so they deposed him, and he was executed in September, uh, September 15th, 1842. So this shows uh, some of those uh, individuals there. Interesting that uh, Costa Rica does have his uh, face on a stamp as well. And the uh, Honduras stamp down here shows his tomb in El Salvador, and his remains were returned there a few years after his execution, and he's interred there in uh, San Salvador. Okay, so enough about the basic uh, biography of uh, Morazon. Um, by my count, there are uh, quite a number of stamps that show Morazon on stamps in terms of face different issues here. Uh, Honduras has the largest number of those, 25 face different, although there's a lot more um, versions of them. Some of those have been, some of those stamps have been uh, duplicated many times, different values, different overprints. So we'll cover that briefly tonight. 25 by my count from Honduras, uh, seven from Salvador, one from Chile, one from Costa Rica, one from Cuba, and I'd be well pressed to know if there's any other countries that have honored this Central American uh, hero here. The statue here is in La Paz, Honduras. Uh, it was erected on the uh, bicentennial of his birth. Something that kind of is of interest to me is that the American banknote company was involved in producing many different stamps showing motors on. And these show close-ups of the engravings of those stamps through the years. So from left to right, this is the 1878 Honduras American Banknote uh, series. These are the uh, next one is the 1912 Salvador Bicolors, the 1940 Pan American Souvenir Sheets. This is from the Costa Rican Portraits in 1940. This is my favorite, the postal tax from 1941, and then 1942, the Honduras Death Centennial stamp, all by the American Bank Note. They show a lot of similarities in uh, the engraving, and one of the questions I've tried to answer is, did they by any chance use the same uh, dyes to produce these uh, stamps? And I don't believe they did, but I... Um, still asking that question to find out if that is indeed a possibility. So let's go through a look a little more details at these individual stamps uh, showing Morazan. So in 1878, these were the first stamps that showed Morazan, produced by again the American Banknote Company. Um, there were a set of seven values that were produced by them. Um, Honduras got 30 through 36. These are die proofs that are shown here. And I have uh, two specimens that I've acquired over the year, one that says specimen in Spanish and one that says, I believe, specimen. Oh, they're both in Spanish, Moistra. So it is two uh, Spanish printings of the uh, uh, specimens there. In 1889, um, our good friend Seebeck got involved and reprinted these, uh, Scott 30A through 36. Although it says fake here, it just kind of shows the representation of the difference in gum and the thickness of paper. And that's how you tell the difference apart. The, the reprints, even though it says fake here, are on thick, soft paper with yellowish gum. Well, this becomes important if you're a student of postal history. I do not have a cover with any of the original Morazan stamps on it. Uh, they are quite rare. Um, market price now might be from anywhere from $300 to $700 a piece when you can find them. This one shows, I believe, Scott 36. My information is that none of the stamps uh, with the four reals issue or the one peso stamps are known on cover. And any of those um, so called reprints um, are not, uh, that are found on cover are probably uh, facsimiles or fakes or fictitious uh, covers. Um, I would be happy to adjust those comments if that is not correct. Let's move on to the next face 
different one. So this is really the second war is on face different different issue here. 1919, the statue, which is in uh, Mauricio's background um, in Tegucigalpa, uh, a whole series of stamps, different values here. It's got 184 through 193. It was issued in 1919, but it saw service well into the dates, uh, the rest of the early part of the 1900s, 1933 was the last issue. So there's over 100 different catalog numbers assigned to this basic uh, lithographic stamp here due to many overprints, multiple printings and plate variations. There's the statue. Uh, this is a uh, statue, a picture taken uh, off the internet uh, when I visited there recently, I would note that the plaque on the right hand side is no longer there. It's just bare marble. Uh, this, the plaque showing the Battle of Trinidad is there. Uh, on the other side, I believe, is a plaque for the Central American Republic here. Um, there are um, the, Here's uh, some of the stamps again. There's C-121. We've already seen that. The other side shows the uh, seal of the Central American Republic. I did find a postcard uh, that had my favorite stamp on it, RA2, um, showing the statue on one side and Morazan on the other. And this is one of my favorite pieces in my uh, accumulation of Morazan stamps here. Okay, so what did they do with the stamp? Well, let's go back to the 1919s. Um, they overprinted remainders showing from left to right here, there's Scott 202 and 202A, and you get different catalog numbers when, of course, the V is missing on Scott 202A. Uh, this is the old 185 um, with the missing V on the bottom of the pair. On Scott 283, this was reprinted in 1926, so it could be used again. Over here is, uh, um, official airmail stamp number 25 revalued from one peso to 1.2 uh, limpira that there was a currency change that was in there of course and over here on the right is now this is a double overprint here this originally was uh, scott 188 when it was issued in 19 then it was first that it was overprinted in 1921 for official use and it became uh official 070 and then revalued a third time to 70 centavos and reservice for air official service so i don't know how many it's not a record but uh it comes close to it for repurposing reusing re recycling um, uh, postal paper this one is a little bit on the controversial side i would still love to have uh, one of these for my collection um the uh, supposedly the first airmail stamps, according to the Sanabria catalog, are a 1925 area, uh, Corio Aereo 25 centavos. Um, this is different from the uh, Black Honduras issue, which came a little bit later. They're found on the one cent and the two cent, uh, but most of the philatelic authorities fail to recognize these as legitimate issues. Um, I picked up the pictures off the internet because they put them on the Robert Siegel auction catalog in 2016. Uh, I bid, but I was not able to have my pockets deep enough to grab Sanabria one and two. Uh, I'd love to have some conversation about this at the end of the presentation. Moving on, 1940, Pan American Union was uh, being honored uh, to celebrate their 50th anniversary. The 14 centavos low value had Morazan up in the corner. There's the picture there. I uh, used a profile uh, portrait of Morazan. So the individual uh, 14 centavos stamp in there is C100A. C100 is the number for the entire souvenir sheet. Okay, let's do some recycling. The 1940 sheetlets were again overprinted with different uh, notations. The first one came in 1945. This is C-154, uh, celebrating the victory of the Allied nations in World War II. And then they did it again in 1951, this time to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Postal Union. Um, 
they were in both perf and imperf on the overprint, but I would note on the UPU, there were only 300 of the imperf souvenir sheets that were overprinted. So these can become a little pricey uh, current, current, color, yeah, current catalog value from what I understand is about 250 US dollars for C187A. I happen to have uh, two of them sticking around my place right now. Here's my little baby, RA number two. It didn't start out that way. Uh, this was originally classified by the Scott catalog as a regular postage stamp and given the number 341. Uh, so from 1941 to 1956, that was the catalog number. For some reason, somebody woke them up and told them, hey, this is a postal tax stamp and it shouldn't have, it should have the RA abbreviation in front of it. So in the 1957 catalogs, this was renumbered to be RA number two. The problem was they already had a RA number two. So they bumped the uh, second postal tax forward by a number. This is now RA number three. And 341 in the Scott catalog for Honduras is a still vacant number as far as uh, uh, the Scott listings are concerned. The year after that, uh, the American Banknote Company was uh, commissioned to further commemorate the uh, passing of Morazan with this eight stamp series, Scott 120 through 127. Uh, you've seen a couple of those stamps already a couple of times. Let's take a closer look. Um, this was the high value to Lempiras. Notice it's the new uh, currency at the time. Of course, this is a specimen from the AVNC archives. Um, they also made available when they issued these first day uh, covers. And because it, it was that time period when they had to have the postal tax stamp, they both occurred on the same cover. And here's an even closer look up of the cancellation uh, commemorating the uh, passing of General um, Morazan in 1942, the 100th anniversary of that. 1992 was the birth bicentennial of Francisco Morazan. Um, this is a statue of Morazan that is uh, still standing today in Amapawa. I visited there this past Christmas and it's in a central park on the uh, Isla de la Tigre, the Island of Tigers in English. Uh, so this statue, you can see this one on the um, 10 centavo issue here of the 1992 set. Also included here is a, uh, a stamp of his wife of 95 centavos, some of his personal effects, which I believe if the caption is correct, these are in Spain of all places as opposed to being in Honduras or Central America. Um, and then this is uh, Morazan on a statue, but it's not, or a horse, but it's not the same view as the statue in Tegucigalpa. The linchpin on this set uh, representing his birth by Centennial is a souvenir sheet. There's the, the whole thing there. We showed you the, the close up of the Battle of Trinidad before, and it shows, um, Morazan participating in the Battle of Trinidad and of course some angels and other things. There's the little cabin in the background that still stands today. There are a few recent issues that from Honduras that recognize uh, Francisco Morazan. First one I wanna to call to note is the um, hydroelectric project named after Morazan. Uh, the dam itself is called excuse my pronunciation, pronunciation, El Cajon. This was completed in 1986. It's the largest infrastructure project in the country of Honduras. These two uh, are C851 and C852. Uh, another recent issue is a series of departmental stamps representing the 18 departments of Honduras. Um, and the uh, Department of Francisco Morazan, which is the capital district, has his uh, uh, equestrian cap uh, statue there again 
This was issued in 1983. It's got 905F. There was a series of 18 stamps there. Okay, uh, so we have a couple of um, postal um, uh, new issues that have come out. Um, these are ones that I actually acquired uh, just recently. Uh, this six stamp, stamp set honors a university in Honduras that was founded in 1956. It is uh, primarily designed or was designed to teach train teachers. Uh, the um, Francisco Morazan Pediological National University now has 23,000 students in eight different locations throughout Honduras. Three of the stamps show Morazan. This is more artistic. There's the typical profile, and this shows the seal of the university with his uh, face on it. Okay, here's the postal stationery coming up. Mount Morazan occurs on uh, two different kinds of postal stationery, some postal cards. Uh, if you're following postal stationery, you should be familiar with the Higgins and Gage catalog. So this is H&G number one and two postal cards. And there's also a aerogram that has his uh, 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 profile on it. This would be Higgins and Gage. Uh, number four, and of course they overprinted it with different values, so it becomes uh, some other values, which I don't have the catalog number since I don't have uh, that information uh, on there. Okay, so is that enough about Honduras? That's 25 face different postal issues, not including the duplicates uh, that we have uh, talked about there from Honduras. The number is wrong on the slide, I have to update that of course. Okay, let's take a breath and let's move on to Salvador. Uh, since we were out talking about postal stationery, we'll start off with that. Uh, this was the uh, 1889 envelope with a bust of Francisco Morazan. And uh, these, uh, I don't know too much about the history of these, but they do have uh, provisional uh, stamped on them. And there are um, many different little subtleties to the type fonts provisional here, um, maybe as many as six or seven different type fonts there. Um, anyway, it shows Morazan, so it fits into the collection. Really, the Morazan issues in Salvador, as far as I'm concerned, started in 1887 through 89 with this allegory issue. This is an allegory picturing the female figure of El Salvador surrounded by the names of four liberal Central American leaders, Barrios, Jerez, Cabanas, and of course, Morazan. So it has his name, it doesn't have his picture on it. So there were basically uh, three basic stamps, one centavo, two centavo, and three centavo that had those names around the corners. And then they were subsequently overprinted and they encompass now 12 recognized stamps. There are many unofficial examples of these stamps as well. Um, as an aside, this design was kind of recycled by our hero Seebeck into the, the first Seebeck issue of Salvador. Of course, they took out the names of the four Central American heroes there. Okay, the next set from Salvador it is back to the statues. This is the 1903 statue issue from Salvador. Uh, the Plaza Francisco Morazan in San Salvador has a monument to Morazan. It was erected in 1882. And the base notes different battles in the Central American Republic struggles and five figures, each representing the five Central American Republic nations. So this issue in 1903, there were 11 different values that depicted the monument as far as regular postage values. It's got number 283 through 293. Uh, and, and here come the reprints or the overprints, I should say, revaluation surcharges, different type fonts, different colors of ink and different stamps. So this expands the series to 15 different listed stamps 
the catalog values of these stamps are not very much. I think the most expensive one in the catalog is listed as only 30 US dollars, but finding legitimately used surcharges um, on a cover is a real challenge. And if you were to find covers available, you would definitely be advised to expertize these uh, because they have been extensively uh, faked. Same design was slightly modified by Salvador to make a set of official stamps. There's 10 of them, 0243 through 0253. Uh, there's some close-ups and of course there's some six different uh, revalues there. And then there's some postage uh, due stamps with the same basic design here. Uh, this is a set of uh, proofs and it's not a, a good picture because I lifted the picture from a auction catalog, I believe. I've only found one of these postage due issues. This one here is J69. The only one I have it catalogs for less than $2 but still it was a hard to find uh, stamp for this accumulation of stamps about waters on. The same statue was reissued in terms of uh, some postal stationery for Salvador. You can see the Higgins and Gage numbers here. Um, there are um, uh, five basic envelopes from what I understand with three overprinted versions. And then as far as the postal cards, I've seen three different card values with several different surcharge uh, issues there. And again, if uh, some of these, I don't have a, a good idea of the accurate uh, catalog value. These are some pretty ones here. Um, unfortunately, I've got these overlaid so you can't see them, but these are the regular stamps of Salvador from the 1903 issue, along with the postal stationery revalued. So these are, this is a really interesting little um, set of stamps there from Salvador showing Marzon. The American Bank Note Company was employed uh, in 1912 to issue a couple uh, Morazon stamps, very similar to the ones or early stamps from Honduras. Uh, the five centavo came out first. It's a bicolored issue. This is number 404. I was able to obtain a die proof of it here. Uh, and then in 1921, they recycled the same design with a different uh, value, 25 centavos, um, 497. And that 25 centavo was again, overprinted official and then revalued with one cent, six cent and 20 cent stamps. These are numbers 487 through 489 at the bottom. And the official stamp was 0347 up here. We're not done yet with Salvador, we're close. Uh, they had a series in 1953 honoring both Morazan and General Barrios. Uh, there were eight stamps in the series, three of them had Morazan. They all had this black overprint on here, uh, CDC, it was a control mark. So um, be interesting to see if you see one with legitimately without that control mark on there. Um, and then of course, uh, they had another issue with a 22 cent, um, and this was revalued to uh, honor the 1962 uh, Central American Industrial Exposition. So this becomes number 729 in the Scott catalog for Salvador. I have yet to find any of these on a cover, so I'm searching for them. I'm sure they were used legitimately, but it's just not something that's on a lot of people's uh, radar screen possibly because they're uh, lithograph stamps. They're not quite as attractive as the engraved stamps and they were pretty commonplace types of stamps. Once more for Salvador, postal stationery, they had a postal card and this was actually the last postal card that has been issued by Salvador in 1955. This is a, a die proof and the full card and uh, show a close up of the uh, the face there of Morazan on the six centavo postal card there. Higgins Gage postal card 116 is the catalog number. Oh, I forgot, there's one more. Um, his bicentennial birth, uh, 1992, Morazan uh, was honored by El Salvador by a, um, I'm not sure what is it, it's not a peso, I forget what their uh, currency is, 
uh, but it's the one whole unit of currency there uh, for Scott number 1329. Okay, let's change countries. Let's go to Costa Rica. This won't last very long. They had a two uh, stamp series issued in uh, 1983 with two Central American heroes. One of them was Morazan, the other one was uh, Val uh, Valier. I'm killing his pronunciation there. Sorry about my Spanish. 60, 660 is the Morazan stamp there. Um, here's Costa Rica, the place of his execution. Uh, the original stamp uh, was the 45 centavo stamp, which was an airmail stamp, which is why it's C83. Uh, and then in a few years later, 1943, they reissued it as a regular postage stamp, 15 uh, 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 centimos. Uh, nice cover here with both of them on the same cover, and it is a censored cover sent to New York. So I think this is a really neat one to add to this uh, assortment of Morazan collections. Um, you can find a lot of these stamps with other uh, stamps, but finding the two together on one cover was kind of kind of like a, a godsend when I found that one in the, the uh, postal dealer uh, box there. Cuba had one Morazan stamp. Um, I would imagine that a lot of you are somewhat familiar with this set in 1937. Uh, Cuba decided that they were going to honor 15 American, not just Latin American, but American countries. Uh, they were the only postage stamps that were allowed to be used in Cuba during October 13th through 15th in the year 1937. The proceeds from the sale of these stamps were to go to the Association of American Writers and Artists. <coughs> um, catalog value for the whole series, Mint. Um, uh, none hinged is $160. The 10 centavo stamp is the one I'm interested in here. It's number 353 Cuba, and it shows Morazan. Interesting thing is that the Morazan stamps were printed on the same sheet of paper as the Haiti stamp, so you can get some gutter pairs. I think I have a, uh, uh, a gutter pair on cover too. Uh, covers are hard to find of this, but I did find uh, one of the uh, Morazan stamps on cover, again, because they were only issued for three days worth of postal use. Um, I'm not going to um, include a lot of the information that was on my previous presentation made a couple of years ago on the Honduras postal tax stamp. This is a chance to catch your breath. I'm going to grab it quick shot of water and then continue on what I've got in the next couple slides is what I have found new um, um, when you um, that I've, I've found in the last four years and it's a good time for a riddle when does unreal become real when you have a Honduras 19 Honduras number 33 that's that's an English riddle. Um, sorry, but I had to put it in there to put a little levity in there. Okay, let's go back and look at some of the new information. Thanks to some of my friends in Honduras, uh, they were able to find a copy of La Gaceta, the official government um, uh, newspaper. And um, in 1941, Honduras approved its first postal tax uh, issue, which was this Red Cross stamp over here. And then uh, that was, I think, number 66 was the first one. Number 99, 99 was the one I'm concerned with. February 27th, 1941, published uh, a week later, and it authorized the printing of the Honduras postal tax stamp up here in the corner. The funds were be to be used to uh, memorialize the centennial of Morazan's passing. Based on information that I found from the American Banknote Company archives and on the number of stamps that were supposed to be produced and issued, and the fact that this uh, stamp was only one centavo, you add them all up, and only 20,000 lempiras could have been raised for the purpose of these memorial uh, type activities. 
So by today's funds, that's not a lot, but I guess in that time, it was uh, a substantial sum that helped to underwrite the cost. And you have to realize the at that point in time, uh, the world was facing uh, imminent World War II involvement. So there wasn't a lot of free funds available for any such things. Uh, a little bit back to my history involvement of this. In 1990, uh, the American Banknote Company archives were auctioned off and one of the lots uh, had this postal tax production file. Um, my pockets were not that deep, but I was able to successfully bid on lot 439. And this is what I got. I got the internal worksheets, which have a lot of details on how the stamp was supposed to be put together and the details of it. The composite model with some approval signatures, the large die proof with final approval signatures, worksheets, which included the names of the engravers, and how much time they spent in it, and a piece of paper that was all folded up that described how the sheet was to be laid out when they ran it through the printing press up in uh, the American Banknote Company. Um, since that time, I was not able to, uh, I, I found this uh, trial color for RA2. I've never seen anything else like this. Um, they uh, did this trial color. I'm not sure what, why the number is different from the folio number for the rest of this stamp. Um, but this is the final color on this uh, um, uh, die proof uh, card here. Number 15 brown was the color that they call this for the American Bank Gun Company. And again, uh, I think most of you are familiar. These are plate numbers. They are folio numbers uh, represented the file that uh, all this stuff was uh, socked away in the American Bank Gun Company files. First day of issue, August 1st, 41 in Tegucigalpa. These are philatelic covers. You could not send a letter anywhere with one centavo or four centavos, um, but this one's neat because it has the folio number up there and a couple different uh, first day covers that I've found over the years. Um, I got a lot of covers. I have more than 160 covers with uh, the RA number two on it some way. Uh, so I took it upon myself to kind of look through and kind of quantify where these things came from and where they went to. 38% of these covers have come from Tegucigalpa. That's not going to be a surprise. Uh, 15 of them have come from places that are unique, that I've only got one example of the cover coming from that particular village, town, or city, according to the circular date stamp on the covers themselves. Uh, this one's from Okotepeque. Uh, surprisingly enough, look who it's addressed to, President Karius. Interesting. Um, where did they go to? Out of the 160 plus covers I have, only 7% were used within the country of Honduras. 75% of the total were sent to the US. 28% of the total were sent to New York City. Only 18% went to foreign uh, destinations, and these are the major countries, mostly uh, Europe, Latin American countries, and Canada. Uh, I have not yet seen any of these going to Asia or Africa. I'd love to see one someday to see if they actually used it to go to those continents. How much did it cost to mail a letter? Um, this is a... Uh, cover with the RA2 on the uh, um, front there on a, on a uh, uh, fairly high uh, value um, frank cover. Um, up here in the top, uh, this kind of summarizes of the covers that I have. Um, I have the low rate of two centavos, it's a philatelic cover, to uh, 3.23 lempiras, and again, that's a philatelic cover. 19% uh, of the total have the total of 10 cents franking on it, 10 centavos. 30% uh, have 18 centavos, and 7.7% of the total covers have 34 cents. 
um, you can find 67 other different stamps along with them, co-franking with them. So that's just uh, by the numbers, some of the uh, facts and figures of the use of this particular stamp. I'd love to find a uh, postal rate uh, catalog for the period of time to really understand what the rates should have been and that will help me to determine what the weight, for example, of this cover was. Notice that most of these covers with RA1 and have RA1 and RA2 together both. This is a very small cover, about three inches by four inches. It's also censored. Um, this is the smallest size cover I have with the RA number two on it. And of course, we have some that look kind of weird because they have foreign cancels on them. Of course, you guys know that these are packet boat covers posted on the high seas by the United uh, Fruit Company, the banana boats, if you will. Um, this was posted only a few days after the release of the stamp. So somehow they rushed some of these postal tax stamps onto the boats so they could use them for these covers. Kind of interesting to see that. This is something weird that I'd really like to get a better handle on what it all is all about. Richard Washburn uh, gave this to me or sold it to me for a dollar or something several years ago. And if you're familiar with Richard, he's a, probably one of the premier collectors of Honduras material that's out there. It's uh, described as a safe conduct pass for uh, this Fred Moore to go from San Pedro Sula, uh, good for 20 days. Again, it was uh, done during World War II. I think they needed just something to go underneath the official seal here from the tribunal or the commandant, and they just grabbed the cheapest things out of the drawer that they could, these two postal tax stamps. But uh, this is kind of a sort of a unique use as far as I can tell here. Here's um, a lot of these covers, um, because of World War II, have gone through censorship. December 7th, 1941, when the United States entered the war is when Honduras began to start picking up and doing a lot of censorship, or the United States picked up censorship of a lot of these covers coming into the United States. So the first indication of censorship was a mark like this, released by post office inspector on the authority of the censorship officer. Um, I have a couple like this. Uh, then they started to use the, uh, as they call it, the railroad tracks. This was primarily used for uh, what I understand military um, that were um, uh, posted abroad, uh, the actual military personnel as opposed to others. So that's what the, uh, my understanding of the railroad track type of cancer uh, cancel here. Of course, this one was going to Canada, so it required a little more franking, and it was also an airmail cover, kind of an interesting combination there. <clears throat> early censorship was not consistent in the early part of the conflict. So down here, February 21st in Tila, um, this was censored. And then a week later, they let this one through without censorship. Can't figure that one out. Um, by looking at the numbers, there is a book by a Mr. Dan, D-A-N-N, -N, uh, who was involved in looking at all of these censorship marks. Uh, he's got a census of where these cities were, where the censorship occurred. 2059 happened to be San Antonio, and a lot of the covers were shipped to San Antonio, where the censors actually did their work. Uh, the tape. Uh, changed during the war from paper tape like this one uh, in February of 1943. And then it changed over to cellophane tape sometime later that month. In February uh, 26, this one was uh, sent uh, from the Rosario Club using a cellophane type tape, which of course is eaten through the paper and discolored it over the period of time from then to now. This one is probably one of the most interesting covers to figure out that I have that deals with this RA number two. RA number two is on the back of this. So what's going on here? Well, this is registered and airmail. The total Franklin is 1.32 Lempira and it was censored three times. It was mailed uh, in Lima, 
Nueva, which is near San Pedro Sula. Uh, then it was examined in Honduras. There's the back of it. There's the front of the paper sensor from Honduras before it left Honduras. And then after it entered into the United States, it had the domestic examination by, uh, what is it, 12, uh, 12184. Um, again, I think that, oh, this was Brownsville or maybe San Antonio, uh, but it was, uh, then it was shipped over to Brownsville. Let's go back. Um, canceled there on May 28th. Again, May 23rd to May 28th. And then finally, there was a military inspection. Where is that? Uh, over here, there's the military inspection. Um, um, took another look at it. So it was uh, examined three times. Um, and then they had some auxiliary markings that are supposed to be liable to customs duty. Um, now look at the address. It is a Society of Little Flower, a church in Chicago, uh, probably contained currency, which is why they registered this thing. Uh, the latest back date on it was June 22nd in Chicago. So it took a while to take that uh, envelope through all that uh, censoring and get it uh, to where it was supposed to be in Chicago. Uh, the last cover I want to show you on the R8 number two is uh, something that anybody that's focused in on a single stamp is probably want to do. When's the last known postal use of that stamp? And this is uh, the one that I found so far, March 27th, 1945. Okay. By this time, the required postal tax period for the Morazan activities had long since passed. So its use was probably as a substitute tax for the Red Cross stamp or possibly as postage. Um, it was uh, again, a cellophane tape. Um, the number is 558. I had to really look hard to find that one. Um, in New Orleans was where that was on its way to Arlington, Virginia. And I have another cover uh, sent to the same person and this was posted by an employee of the Inter, um, the Institute of Inter-American Affairs uh, to his wife during the end of the war there uh, in Honduras. Uh, Don Lee uh, is now the fourth largest city in Honduras found in the central part of Central America. So if you can find a cover later than that, I would love to take it off your hands with the RA number two on it. Um, my final slide here uh, on the presentation, this is a picture that I took uh, a few years back when I visited San Jose, Costa Rica, and they do have this beautiful park where they executed Francisco Morazan. And the other, in the middle here, this is uh, Morazan's signature. On the right, this is a statue that I have yet to visit in New Orleans of Francisco Morazan, who's together with a lot of other um, American heroes. And with that, I am turning this back to Henry. I'm going to stop. Thank you, screen. Daniel. Really, really good presentation. So at this I point, like thank you. If anyone have any question or comment for Daniel. Mauricio. Uh, first of all, Daniel, I want to congratulate you for this nice presentation. I saw it before you share it uh, with the rest of us when you sent me the original version, but I, I enjoy it much more this time now that you were explaining everything. And I'm, I'm glad actually that you are collecting um, a, a stamp from my country and, and congratulations for that. I, I do have some comments um uh, the the about, about especially about the stamp with the statue that, that I have on my background that that uh overprint that says Avelitado 1926 I believe you mentioned that they that they made a reprint of the stamp that is not not actually a reprint is the same 1919 the leftovers they just reauthorize it that, that is why it was habilitada 
for 1926 because legally by that time that stamp was no longer valid. So they had to validate it somehow. So no, no reprints, we, we don't do any reprints here. Um, uh, technically all our stamps are commemoratives. We don't have definitive issues. So yeah, th those leftovers, um, thanks, for, thanks to those leftovers of many other issues is that we have many overprints and surcharges which some people think is a nightmare for all Honduran collectors that many varieties of surcharge and overprints, but that makes the hobby interesting. Uh, as for the Sanabria 1 and 2, um, actually recently, I believe this week, a uh, cover fragment with the Sanabria 1 was sold uh, quite uh, cheap, if I may say, it was sold for 500 euros. Uh, and I say this is cheap because a few years ago, there was an auction with Sanabria 1 and 2 unused, which closed in 28,000 Swiss francs. So if we have the mint 1 and 2, two for 28,000 Swiss francs, and we have a cover fragment with Sanabria 1 with all, for only 500 euros that went cheap. So that's that's interesting. They are out there. I know Scott doesn't list uh, the airmail with the Morazan, but uh, Sanabria does. And apparently that, that stamp had a certificate. Um, I didn't saw the certificate, but apparently it had one, I think. But yeah, they're really, really scarce. As for the money for the stamp, yeah, 20,000 lempiras in the 1940s was a lot of money. The exchange rate was two, two, two for one for the US dollar. So it was $10,000 in that time, which you could do a lot with $10,000 uh, in, in Honduras, especially in that time with, when everything was really cheap. And uh, finally, right for now, the, the rates of those of that era, 1940s, that's for us a nightmare because we haven't been able to find them. Uh, we know they should be printed out somewhere, but if you see the covers, sometimes the cover has one cent more, one cent less, two cents more, two cents less. Sometimes the postal clerk they didn't really notice or they didn't care if the, if the envelope had more or less. They just mail it. Uh, they didn't add it. So the, if you could go with, you could go to the post office with the cover already po uh, posted, uh, with the post postage uh, uh, attached and just drop it in the mailbox and that's it. And, and that's why trying to figure out the correct postage for that area is really difficult. Hopefully one of these days we should find a, a rate that should give us some clarity on that matter. And once again, congratulations for this uh, very interesting presentation and, and, and thank you a lot. Uh, responding to Mauricio's uh, comment on um, what was the money used for I would love to have a concrete example of something that was spent back in 1942-43, a statue that came from that money, an event that was sponsored that, um, and that's going to require probably going back to uh, current news, newspapers at that time looking for events, uh, something that I just don't have the resources or time to kind of do that. Yeah. About that, I don't know, Edgardo, what something was actually done with that money? You're in mute. Edgardo, your mic is Your off. microphone is off. Turn it on. I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Most of the money um, it was really uh, used for monuments and speeches and meetings um printing of books um they had a whole year to to do that 
that's why the this uh, stamp was uh, issued only for one year <clears throat> but uh, at the end of the year um, there were so many leftovers that uh, they didn't want to throw them away so they continued uh, using them for regular process that's why we find them so far as uh, 1945 um, but uh, there, there was a committee created uh, to be in charge of uh, doing all the commemorations of Morazan, including the, the stamp issue. Thanks. Thank you. Daniel, I, I have a curiosity actually caught my attention when you show that uh, plate proof, not the plate proof, but the actually die proof you got uh, during the auction. Um, I have never seen before all the, the additional supporting documents that you have, like the actual journal of the printing, who the printer was, and all those. I'm wondering what type of archive did you get? Did you get also the intermediary essays or that was a different lot because the lot you got seems quite unique. And uh, many of the American bank uh, proof that are out there, rarely, if any, had that much information as the one you got. Yes. Um, what you saw in that uh, one slide, I can call it back up if you, if you wanna see it. Um, what, you, what you saw is what I got. Um, I only got two examples of the stamp I don't think I got any quantities of the actual printed product. It was just the uh, the model and the die proof with signatures on it, and then the background information that showed, um, you know, there was like two or three time cards that listed the various people that were involved in engraving and burnishing and all that. So I have the names of the people that worked on that individual project that were employees Amazing. of the American Bank Note Company. Um, it's kind of fascinating to see that that records are still there. I would have to assume that there are a few other um, similar files that had been released in that auction in 1990, uh, but I don't know if it was consistent or not. It's just like they just took the file and put it up for sale. And this was not something that was a, a high power stamp. So I was able to, to grab it at a pretty reasonable price. I think it was like it was less than $200 is what I paid for that. What amazed me is the supporting documents that you get. Yes, that's the that's, value there. Yeah, that, that's, that's the true value. The, it's amazing, so congratulations. Thank you. Henry, uh, if, I, if I may complement that point. Sure. Uh, in, in that particular auction, there were a few lots that were production files coming directly from the American bank note. And, and basically there were not for all the issues, and it varies from country to country. If you have the catalog, you can check which which of the Peru issues had it, were, were offered or not. Or, or if you don't have it, I can I can send you a photo of, of it. But yeah, for, for I example, don't have it. You can send. Yeah, I can send you a few photos. I don't know how much there is of Peru. I don't remember. But uh, but for El Salvador, there was the production file mostly of the 20th century, early 20th century, 1914, 1916. And I believe one of the airmails, and, and that was it. Uh, out of, I don't know, 20 different issues, there were only three production files offered. And a, a lot of them, as, as far as I understand, were like like Dan mentioned, they were preparatory material or documentation. They were not, they did not have the, the final product in them because a lot of the final product was basically uh, overprinted with specimens. And these were separate lots in this auction. There were either yeah. index cards with specimens or, uh, or uh, sheets of 100 or 50, depending on the issue that were overprinted with a specimen and they were offered in a separate lot. That's why. Unbelievable. I can only imagine that when the American bank archives were intact, right? It's like an old ruin, an old pyramid. I mean, you can go there and you can have pretty much the end-to-end -end story because I'm assuming every single stamp had a folio when 
the auctioners came into the picture, they started making it more commercially appealing and they broke all that history. That's why it's, it's fascinating to see all that supporting document that even in the whole spectrum of what was sold over the years for American Bank, I would say that probably very few of those proofs come with that much additional information. No, very, so, very few, Henry. Very, there very are a few. few. Yeah. I, I saw the ledger books, but I never seen something individual at this level. I still have the catalog from that auction. And if anybody is uh, curious about what lots were sold or once the descriptions as they were printed back in 1990, I'd be more than happy to take pictures and send them. Just send me an yep. email. Is there anything there from El Salvador? And I'll, just, I'll go look and see how many lots and send you a, yeah. a copy of those pages of the catalog. Sure. Yeah, I, I I have the catalog as well, Dan. Thank you. So so yeah yeah I I know which which issues there were some production files. There there were not that many. Amazing. That's great. Thanks, Guillermo. I have any another, other question? Yeah, oh. no, I have a comment regarding those uh, covers of the first Morazan issue of Honduras. Uh, yes, indeed, they're very, very rare. Um, recently, I kind of figured out why. Uh, there is a, a collection here um, that has recently been prepared that has about five frames filled with covers. So now I know who has them all. So uh, and, and each, each time that one of those covers appears on the market, um, the owner of this exhibit uh, usually buys it buys them so and yes they're really rare and uh, that price price range that you mentioned it's 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 is correct and um yeah the 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 high values of that issue i believe it's unknown uh, on a postal use so right. so right now we haven't i hope i assume some some maybe one or two are used because in that time that was a lot of money but we haven't been able to find those uh, pieces yet. Hopefully one of these days, one of those should appear in the market, but uh, let's keep our fingers crossed until that occurs. Hmm. Uh, Guillermo. Yes, uh, first first of all, sorry, I cannot put my camera on and I'm in a car, but uh, Dan, uh, thank you for the, the conference. I, I joined late. So I, I I joined about when you were up when you're about to finish El Salvador. So I will have to watch the video, but but thank you. And at the risk of sounding repetitive, I I would be interested to understand why you got into collecting Morrison. Good question. I had meant to mention that. Mi esposa nacimiento de Honduras. It's an excuse for me to enjoy my hobby of stamp collecting and get away with it with my wife. <laughs> Typically, that's the way it works. <laughs> we, um, in the discussion about the Morazan covers, I actually do have one of those early Morazan stamps on cover. I don't know if the camera will show this. Yeah, we'll Just see. Know, it. We'll we'll it. Leave it there. Okay, that's uh, with the number yeah. one on there too. Yeah, that's a, a, a nice fantasy cover, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 1974. Latest known use. <laughs> nice. Uh, quite, quite interesting that cover that you showed us with the postal tax stamp on a um, uh, posted on a uh, United Fruit uh, steamship. The packet boat. Yeah, the packet boat. Yeah, that 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 could be two possibilities. I don't I don't think they. They had the stamp on board. Maybe someone just dropped the letter directly on the boat when it was uh, at uh, at the port. That could be the other explanation. They they pay for the postage, and they just drop it at the boat, which was a possibility for for people in in the port. They could leave it at the post office or directly uh, give it to the person at the at the ship, and that way it will, be, it will arrive uh, faster. Because I so don't think the person would have the postal tax or, or he would be careful enough to add that tax to the postage. 
I've seen a couple. I have uh, two or three steamship covers. Um, there's some with the Red Cross stamp, but mm -hmm. uh, I only think I have one or two with the uh, Morazon stamp on there. Usually. Yeah. Uh, about that, Mauricio, um, those covers came from the Tela United United mm -hmm. States, uh, uh, sorry, United Fruit uh, Company. Mm -hmm. And at the main office, um, they had uh, this bunch of stamps. Mm -hmm. The officials of the company uh, wrote the letters and got the postage from the office, and they gave it to to uh, the 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 captain of mm -hmm. the boat and then took it to to the states and in the boat um, they marked the the covers with the packet boat uh, stamp but uh, it was a usual uh, proceeding uh, mm -hmm. to send the directly from the tela company to the United States by the steamship boats that they were coming and going out uh, every day. Thank you. Any any additional comment or question for Daniel? Mm -hmm. Luis Fernando. Yes, Henry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. I I I got a question regarding the 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 specimen or or color proof you have had in or you showed in in a glue to to a card card cardboard with a number. You said it's a different number. Yes. Let me find it. Looking through the album here of my materials. That's the number of the die. That's correct. They, sometimes they have the different dies and the number mm -hmm. will be because of different variations. They had different numbers on the die. Yeah, that, 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 the other one was really the plate. Black number, yeah. really. Fernando's talking about the, the green one, uh, Daniel. The, the had on the top, right? Eh? Yeah, the, a couple the, of those yeah. plates, and they have the number on the die on the mm -hmm. die on top always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a green plate proof. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can maybe go back to the presentation yes. and find it that way. I can read the number to you. Um, where is it? In 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 fact, I wonder. Why you say you don't know the reason why the number was different? Uh, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't know. It's just a lack of knowledge on my part. But, 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 but you already know that, that what happened with, with American banknote is that they changed the numbers when they uh, formed the album. No, but I they did it for, for every country they were for. Yeah. But those are two different numbers. One is the, sure, the number they are two, the two different numbers. The original the, one the number and the on one the, they are adopted. No, but the number that he's talking about is the number on the top, which was the order That's number. That's the one. Not the die proof yeah, number. It was uh, the number for the green uh, color die was mm -hmm. 82144. Eight, the folio number on the production. No, that, but that's that's that, exactly that, that, what yeah. happens. Yeah, the, the folio the, number is not the same number of the, of yeah. the die. Yeah, so exactly. that's the die number. That's the die number. The one that the, the little one is the yeah. die number. Yeah, the you die is a single die. one, and from that mm -hmm. die they make the whole plate. Yeah. So what you have there was the plate number as opposed to the die number. Because they, sometimes they did more than one die. Okay. We actually do have a presentation by Ross Stoll on, on the numbering followed by the ABM. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Daniel, if you had a chance to, to look at it. No, I have to um, see that. Oh, we, we'll send you the, the link. In, it would probably be worth looking at that. Yeah. Um, yeah, he also wrote an article. Merch. He also wrote an ahead, article in the Collectors Club. He also wrote an article in the Collectors Club Philatelist explaining that. So that's, yeah. that's a very good guy. Yeah, that could be helps. 
Now I got, I got another comment on a different or a different issue uh, regarding the Costa Rica stamp. Yes. Uh, the the uh, as I understand the original uh, painting is the is the 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 one which is in the Congress for every president, no matter if he was executed or whatever happened to him. Uh, uh, every president every president of Costa Rica is is in that gallery in the Congress. And that's the origin of the of the Costa Rican stamp. I I understand that. Uh, uh, because all of the all of the other stamps in that issue is a very long issue. Yes. Um, no less than 50 different stamps. Yes. Uh, are, are from that from that origin. So the uh, somebody took a made a copy of that picture or photograph and sent it to American Banknote. Exactly, that that's it. The production. The, the the person who took the picture sent them all. Okay. Okay. Um. Now there are two facts regarding the, uh, the actual history about uh, when when Morrison took the power in Costa Rica, he came with uh, 500 uh, soldiers from El Salvador. Um, and um, Costa Rica wasn't in fact a complete member of the Mex Mexican empire and never became in fact a full member of the Central American Federation. So Morrison was seen um, sort of illegal, but, but no matter that, he's part of the uh, paintings in the, in, the, in the gallery of presidents. And now more than that, there is a very important park in San Jose, uh, whose name is Morrison, it's, it's named after him. Francisco Morrison. Yes. Uh, it's sort of uh, funny, funny facts regarding the history uh, around this gentleman. Yes, the last uh, picture in the slideshow showed the uh, the bust of Morrison. I have other pictures that I took there. And I was, at that point I was studying Morrison and when I visited San Jose, and took a lot of pictures of the park, but uh, and I have several pictures. None of with the, they, a lot of them did not turn out well, but I have that picture that I included of Morrison's bust, and it's in that park in the central part of San Jose. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that's very close to the location where the execution took place. Probably, he he is he is not buried here. He his no. body was returned to. Yeah, to no, he's buried in he, Salvador. Salvador. Mm. Yeah, and also then the next time that you come uh, down here, you should go. There, there's a nice statue of Morazan in front of the Central American mm. Bank, um, and and yeah, that, at the headquarters of the bank here in Tegucigalpa. So yes, you should include a picture of that in any f further you know, future presentations mm. on Morazan. Yes. And yeah. So yeah. So someday I hope to get to El Salvador and look at the uh, the tomb and the uh, the Central Park there, where they have the uh, the five part statue that was the nineteen oh three issue of Salvador. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to <clears throat> to show to show you. Uh, of course, at the time of Morazan, there were no pictures, no. Right. And but. Uh, um, Morazan uh, married Jose Falastiri, and they had only one daughter, Adela Morazan. After Morazan was executed in San Jose, they had to run for their lives, and so they <clears throat> took refuge in El Salvador. Adela Morazan was about four years old, and eventually she got married in El Salvador to a gentleman known as uh, Cruz Ulloa. Uh, 
he was a Honduran living in El Salvador, a businessman. And happened that uh, my grandfather was the accountant for this uh, person. And uh, he got very close to them. And when uh, the son of Adela Morazan and Cruz Ulloa got married, they sent a picture to my grandfather. And I think that's one of the very few pictures known uh, of one of the descendants of Francisco Morazan. And I wanted, want to show you that. Do you see it? Yes. Yep. Yes, we, yes, we see. It. Okay. <clears throat> That's uh, Francisco Ulloa Morazan, uh, married to, to Carmen uh, Moncada de Ulloa, <clears throat> the day of their wedding. And that was in 1939. Uh, Adela Morazan, uh, the daughter of Francisco Morazan, had a little kindergarten in Santa Tecla. And my father was uh, a pupil there when he was about three or five years old. So I just wanted to share this because uh, this is a very, very rare, maybe a unique picture of one of the uh, grandchildren of Marathon. I would love to have a copy of that. If you would be kind enough to send me an email scan of that, that would be most appreciated. Oh, oh of course. I you are very it. courteous. Sure. Uh, you, should, you should love having the picture. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I donated a copy uh, to the Morrison House here, the, to the museum in Tegucigalpa, and maybe next, uh, maybe in 40, 50 years more, I will donate the picture if I live or to that. But um, uh, my father was uh, Baltasar Alegría, and th that was uh, dedicated to him. And uh, that's, as I told you before, one of the very, very rare memoralia of Francisco Morazan. I will send it to you uh, tonight, uh, Dan. Thank you so and, much. That's much appreciated. And I will send you a little recount of um, the genealogical uh, tree, so you can follow back all the the Morrison uh, family tree. In some of my okay. my research, I came across a uh, magazine article where the reporter was describing the dedication, and I'm confused now if it was the equestrian, I think it was the equestrian statue in Tegucigalpa, or was it the one in Salvador? But it mentioned that one of the speakers was, it described it as Morazan's son. Well, it could not have been his son. It would have been his half-grandson then. That, that gentleman that you have in the picture mm. would have been at one of those statue dedications. Yes. Uh, Adela Morazan was uh, the only legal daughter. Uh, he, he had about... Uh, three or four or five more sons, uh, whatever he went, uh, he was yeah. doing a lot of- It, it may have been charming. one of those other sons, <laughs> too, I don't know. Yeah, so there is a lot of descendants in El Salvador and in Costa Rica also, in Nicaragua. He was a popular man, I can tell. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, very lonely, and the, he was always fighting. So he didn't know if he was going to be able to see the next day. So he had to take advantage of the time. <laughs> yes. Actually, uh, another fact of of Morrison and, and 
re uh, recalling that stamp that you show us then with the La Gaceta, uh, the official paper, I believe Monasan was who brought the first printing press to Honduras. And it was used for for government purposes, right, Edgardo? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, yeah sorry. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, yeah, was for uh, bulletins, government bulletins. bulletins. Yeah, well, government bulletins. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so, yeah. Once the government started mm -hmm. doing their, their the official paper, well, they needed a printing press. And Moras, during Morasan's government, uh, he acquired one of those and and was the first printing press in, in Honduras. Mm -hmm. uh, another fact, actually, it was good that you mentioned it, uh, starting with the, with the Central American Republic. Unfortunately, that collapsed. Uh, there were then a few attempts, uh, more than once, to reunite the five countries. But um, unfortunately, those always failed. Then there was this small union of three countries that also mm -hmm. failed. And uh, then I believe we got tired tired of trying, so so we forgot about the idea, which actually made a lot of sense. It, it still does, but unfortunately, we were never able to uh, have an agreement and make that work. So yeah, it's unfortunate. Hallelujah! Uh -huh. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> okay. <laughs> That, that, that's why it collapsed, right? So you know you get the point. <laughs> well, there, there is always a different that, point of view. Yeah, that's what that, was, that, was, that was the reason we killed him. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, <laughs> the real reason is that he had two great enemies. Uh -huh. uh, the oh, Catholic the, Church. Yeah, the church, yeah. Because uh, he was the first one to separate the <laughs> state church, from... Uh, from the church and the Catholic Church mm -hmm. in Honduras, at least in Honduras, they owned about 20% of the territory mm -hmm. and had all the wealth. Mm -hmm. So he separated the the, the church That's from the state and confiscated all the monasteries and made them schools. And the second enemy was uh, the the English crown. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they didn't want uh, the the countries to be united because they had too many interests mm -hmm. in this part of the world, and if they united, they would be uh, more difficult to to control the countries. Mm -hmm. So uh, those times were barbarians, and uh, people were ignorant, and. The president of Guatemala was in the hands of uh, the church, and he was illiterate. He didn't know to write or to read, and he was president for 65 years. So nothing has changed so far. Yeah, but, yeah. It's interesting in the biography, it mentions that uh, the sources that uh, Morazan was given a chance to drive the British out of La Mosquita mm -hmm. and uh, decided not to go work yeah. in that. Yeah, effort. even now going to that region it is, was impossible. is it impossible. Was impossible yeah, is that, right now it's difficult. In those times, it was almost impossible. Yes. So yeah, there are no roads. Sorry for that. So how could you get an army into La Mosquita? Okay, that, that, that's, that's impossible. Nowadays, it's very difficult. In those days, impossible. So yeah, it made no sense. Eventually, the British left. Then there was nothing there. So yeah, well, just wood and yeah. and they left. It's a fascinating story and yeah. the times of this yeah. this person. Definitely. He was uh, he he was in Peru, and uh, in yeah, Peru, I just learned that. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was uh, he he was alone from uh, General uh, Pedro Bermudez. Uh, he, I think he was president at the time of Peru. And well, Peru during uh, that time had like president every other week, so uh, well, that has been wonderful. <laughs> so with the, that money, he bought uh, a boat and weapons, and so that's how he came back to Central America. But he was in Peru. Mm -hmm. And 
he was after, and in Chile also. And mm -hmm. in Chile, he was offered a position in the Chilean army, but uh, he didn't accept because he wanted to come back to Central America. Fascinating story. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. uh, thank you for all those, those comments. Actually, they add up a lot to, to the great presentation by Daniel. And Daniel, thank you. Thank we you. appreciate you making the time and this great presentation. Fantastic. Thank you.